I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. We have Ben joining us today from Washington State. Uh, and he's worked in an area that I'm very familiar with. We've spent a lot of time up there myself. But first, uh, Forrest, you sent us a picture of a footprint. Can you give us an update on that before we get started? Well, that was, I had a gentleman out here working on some, uh, doing some fence repairs and stuff for me. And <clears throat> we had kind of given him a heads up, a warning, because he was going to come out in the late evening. So I was kind of, when it was cooler, um, because you know it's been in the hundreds here, and it hasn't really cooled off a whole lot. Today it's actually pleasant, but that has not been the, uh, up until this week, it's not been that way. So we had kind of given him a heads up, and uh, I guess he wasn't he wasn't actually too surprised. I guess he's heard stories about that elsewhere around here. Um, so, and I'm outside, guys, so I, I'm sorry there's a siren going off behind me now. Um, but anyway... Um, I guess those people that tried to kill me earlier are out doing damage out on the road now uh, to somebody else. But anyway, um, he uh, was coming out here in the evening, so we had, like I said, given him a heads up. So he just thought he had another fencer act, uh, send that picture to him. They had been out uh, working on some property in South Texas, and they ran across this trail of footprints. And... Uh, so as you can see, the the guy's boot is in the, um, and, and of course they didn't really know how to, you know, uh, measure the foot and everything. They should have had their foot really aligned with the uh, the footprint itself, but they did a pretty good job of it anyway. But that is a big footprint, <laughs> big one. And that's in South Texas someplace. Oh, so this isn't on your property? No, it's not on my property. Oh, no. interesting, yeah. interesting. No. Okay. No. Yeah, that's definitely an adult that, track. That somebody somebody uh i guess he had said something to uh somebody about the fact that they were here on my property and i had shown him some of the pictures and stuff from here and so uh in response to that somebody sent that to him okay interesting all righty well let's get rolling here um so ben is working in an area that my friends and I spent years, you know, camping at an area up by Ashford. And you've heard me talk about this area before. Um, it's all closed off now, but we used to camp near a spot called Copper Creek. And we would hear things up there often. We'd go all the way up on top towards the, and I can't think of the name of the wilderness area, but we used to do hiking into the, Mount Rainier is bordered with wilderness areas, so you, nobody can actually log right up to the park boundary. And uh, so we used to hike a lot up in those areas and regions. So uh, High Rock and, you know, Bertha May Lakes and places like that. And Ben, I'm sure you're familiar with those names. But, mm -hmm. um, and, and my brother-in-law is now a retired uh, social studies teacher and from the Puyallup School District. And one of his students' uh, families camped up there. there. Oh, geez, we're it's probably about 15 years ago now. But they found a line of tracks right there where they were camped. So, tell us what's going on up there. This this is actually south of Copper Creek. Um, is it, well, I don't want to give the exact location because I have to deal with people from up there. Oh yeah, no um, problem. It, it's it's right across about um probably two miles across the, uh, the Squally River there, um to the south, just outside of Ashford. Um, I'm trying to think here. Um, let me think here. Okay. So do you want me to just go back from the whole beginning or? Yeah. Yeah. Take us from the beginning. Stuff? Okay. Well, I was up there. It's under, uh, the BFRO site there. I was with my granddaughter and we were out there trying to fish, uh, find a fishing spot. I had never been, had been up in that area before. And this was in 2010, June. Um, 
as we were trying to get over to the river and everything over there, um, God, I sit there, my mind goes blank. Sorry. Anyway, um, we actually ran into two of them. Now I didn't believe in Bigfoot or anything or any kind of deal. I always think people were crazy when they told me about the stories and everything, but we actually, uh, let me back it up here. When, when we were out there, this was, uh, it was 80 degrees out. This was three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and as we went down into a gully, uh, you know, I was hearing birds and all that kind of good stuff and all that wilderness stuff going on, mosquitoes, all the whole works. And all of a sudden that stuff just cut off. It's like somebody hit a light switch and went completely silent. And we started hearing screams, which was off to the east. I thought, well, what is that or whatever, you know? So um, as I'm still listening to all this stuff going on in this ravine, I decided, well, I'm going to go up there and hike up the top of this little hill here. And I could hear them um, coming from the east. I could actually hear all this brush movement and stuff like that. It was actually just a single creature at the time. So I was up there. I got up to the top of the hill and I was kind of just looking around this this tree and I had a camera with me because I always take pictures of the fish and stuff uh, when I catch them with my granddaughter she was seven years old um and here this creature it was probably 150 feet out or whatever um and this must making its way to the brush and it's just screaming I, I'm still thinking I don't know what this is because you know I was an avid hunter for years and I said man I've been out there for a while and I said I don't know what this is so anyway as I was standing there trying to watch this brush or whatever I actually had something uh, start screaming off to my left, and it was moving towards us. And we can hear all this brush movement. I mean, we're hearing a lot of brush movement. Sounds like a bulldozer coming through the brush. And I got, wow, what is that? You know. And then you got both these creatures were screaming back and forth to one another. And I don't believe they knew we were there because, like I said, we were in a gully. There was no wind coming our direction or whatever. So anyway. Um, Actually, the funny story is I tried to call my son, and it says it was so loud, it was actually making my ears ring and everything. And I was trying to get him on the phone, and for he could hear these calls. And I'm sitting there trying to get my uh, daughter-in-law at the time to wake him up because he was taking a nap, and she wouldn't do it. So I'm sitting there hearing all the screaming. This stuff went on for like 25 minutes, you know. And finally, my granddaughter was getting really scared. And she started crying and everything, and they actually heard her, and they stopped. And then you can actually hear them run off, you know. And they didn't quite get to see what you know, see them, and because it was really the foliage was really really thick. So anyway, and the first thing that came to mind is said, "Wow, this has to be the Bigfoot everybody was talking about or whatever." So <laughs> long story short, went home. Couldn't think, you know, it was kind of just bugging me. I said, wow, these creatures are out there or whatever. So I decided to contact BFRO, I think, through the website and everything. I had an investigator come out, and uh, we met up, and I took him out there, and he found all these footprints. I think they were 17 inch tracks or whatever. And I was telling him the story and everything, and he was telling me about this area. But he was also telling me some crazy stuff about, you know, oh, do you think they were having a family argument or something like this? Said, well, that's ridiculous, you know. It just sounds craziness. So anyway, he was talking and everything, and I says, well, you know what? I might try to go out and get a picture of these things, and I'll track them down or whatever. And he said, well, good luck with that. So I started doing that, and I spent the next couple of years out tracking these things. So... And and when I'm saying tracking it, I went out just about every weekend because I had to work at the time. And uh, I go out and find footprints, and they were breaking trees and stuff like that. And it was always seems like it was an hour behind, or whatever. So that was my first encounter. So after two and a half years, if you assume it was two and a half years, somewhere around there, I actually come across this place I call Charlie Site now. Now Charlie, we went in the morning time. I had come out there about seven o'clock in the morning. Um, I pulled up in my truck, got out, and I heard like three distinct knocks. So I thought, wow, okay. So I was just standing there, and I was just looking over to that direction. His knocks were coming from me. At first, I thought, well, wow, okay, maybe I didn't hear knocks or whatever. But anyway, uh, three outcome 
running by in front of me towards the south. It was about, oh, I would say, uh, 25, 30 feet, big bull and two cows come running by. And I'm standing there just watching it. And all of a sudden, I hear these knock, knock, knock. And I watched the elk change direction. And they actually come out to my right and they come across the road right there. And then I heard knock, knock, knock again. And I watched them change direction again. And then they were just curling back there, you know. And I'm just watching all this going on and going, wow, this is kind of weird. So uh, and then I kept on hearing all these knocks and these elk were changing direction. You can hear that. And then I start hearing some noise off up in there, you know, a big bunch of branches breaking and everything. So I assume this was a group or something at that time. I didn't know anything about Bigfoot. So anyway, I had come back. I decided to come back that night um, and just check out the area. And this was around 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So I got out there. Uh, when I Actually, this was the first time my wife went out with me, too. Um, got out of my car, and I was standing in, in this road. And this complete darkness out there. I mean, you can't, you can't see hand in front of your face or whatever. So I was just standing out there, and I actually heard... Uh, at that time, it was probably a juvenile. Um, they make this little singing noise or whatever. It was vocalizations. Um, and so I was kind of just whooping, you know. And then I actually got in respond back and forth. Then another one joined in, and they were just kind of just singing this or just whatever they're doing. They're vocalizing back to me. And I, this kind of went on for like four minutes. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. And I thought that was the best thing to slice bread. Oh, yeah, I'm interacting with Bigfoots or whatever. So um, at that four minute time, yeah, up on top of this hill, which is south again, um, south of the site, uh, I heard a big scream come down. It was definitely an adult, probably a female at that time. And she was just screaming. It sounded just like a woman, you know, like people always talking about the bloody woman scream or whatever. And it's actually from years of things we've heard this a few times. It's an alert call that the females put out and it calls all of them in. And like I said, she just sit there and screamed and screamed and screamed. And I'm standing there going, wow, OK, maybe a bit off more I could chew because I started hearing all this noise come off top of this hill. I mean, it's coming in my direction. It's like four or five different, you know, directions that the trees are breaking and branches are breaking. Definitely think individuals are coming towards me. So I thought, oh, okay, so I'm going to go get back in my car. Well, the wife locks the car, by the way. That's a funny story. She locked, locked me out of the car, so I'm going to have to deal with this. So I could hear all this stuff moving towards me within like 20 feet now, and then here come the branches flying over. Now, I can't see any of this stuff. I'm only hearing this stuff. I'm getting hit, pelted with dirt and brush and whatever. Rocks are come flying over my head because I can hear them going through the brush behind me. And there's something coming in behind me, too. So I'm standing all this, and I hear all this growling and grunting and whatever. You know, a lot of, a lot of commotion going on and everything. Well, it scared the hell out of me. So I just kind of froze there and just stood there. And I could hear them just walk and pacing back and forth or around around the car. And this is like 20 feet out or so. So anyway, as this was <laughs> going on, like I said, still, I don't want to say what I was thinking at the time. But anyway, it was uh, pretty traumatic and everything. And so I just kind of stood there and they just kind of quieted up. I could still hear all this motion on and actually they're screaming back and forth to one another too they start vocalizing but i could actually hear look like sound like language or whatever um and that's the only time i really picked up on that where i actually heard them like they were talking or something i, I couldn't understand it was back and forth so anyway as i was getting back in my uh finally get the wife to let me in the car She's telling me, well, there's somebody being killed out there. And I said, well, Karen, there's, no, you know, my wife, she says, there's nobody else out here. And so she said, oh, no, that's definitely a woman being killed or whatever. So I actually had to take her back out around the site there, down the road. This is down by Cat Creek. 
to show there's nobody else out here. There was nobody else out there at the time. So I took her out there. These things actually, this is probably like a, a half a mile over to this creek area I'm talking about, Cat Creek. Um, this, as we drove down the road there, obviously when we got out there, I could actually hear them off to our right, probably another 25 feet or whatever. These things are still there. And they're actually, you know, I could hear them growling and stuff like that. And I said, wow, they followed us over. And I had coffee, so I'm just kind of speaking all over the place here. I'm trying to keep it generalized. But uh, basically, I says, well, this is too much for me and everything. And the wife is getting real scared, so I ended up going back home. So anyway, that's where we found Charlie's site. And this was this main group we called the Group A. Um, they hung around Charlie all the time and everything. Now... What's gone out, uh, I've had a lot of stuff happen at this particular site. Um, with Group A, they, they uh, actually moved to the park, I think it was 2015. Uh, and that's an individual there. He is an individual male has been there since then. But he actually moved, they actually moved over to the park. Uh, the only reason I know this because I had a friend, he was recording and happened to pick him up because they just kind of like disappeared. After, uh, after 2015, I didn't hear about hear them anymore in that particular area. Um, so, anyway, like I said, it's got an individual male there. Now, he kind of just comes in and goes. He's always on the West End. But we used to hear them walk around the site when we were there. And that, when I'm saying there, I had one other guy that I had met out there. Um, I don't know if I can mention his name, but his name is Chuck. Nice. And uh, we go out there and uh, set equipment and everything all the time. Um, back to the end, I get in all over the place here. So anyway, um, this group mostly, they, they vocalize and they, they walk around the camp and um, they kind of like did what Bigfoot's do, like they always say. Um, now, we've had uh, two sightings there. I had one in, well, I guess it was probably the same year, 2014, I believe. But we had one at where I um, I was actually out there with the same guy I had investigated the site for BFRO. Um, and we were staying the night. Um, I'm getting sidetracked again, trying to think here. Anyway, um, it was close to dusk. It was probably about nine o'clock at the time. I can't remember what month it was. I think, oh, I do too. It's July. But it was getting close to dusk. It was getting dark. Anyway, we had just come back from going up the hill, checking out and seeing all these footprints and everything. Um, so we were pretty tired from running up and down the hills and everything. And so and usually I set my equipment out, my audio equipment out there yeah, right around dark outside of camp out there about 150 feet so it got kind of misty and everything and so as i grabbed my equipment which is uh two parabolics i have on set on tripods and i had one in each hand and i was walking towards this area the east of camp and i was walking across some deadfall they had some trees and limbs and stuff and i was slipping and sliding and everything as i was doing this i happened to look off to my left and I noticed something peeking around a tree. And when I say that, this the particular individual was about four feet wide, and the tree was like 12 inches wide. And you can clearly see something behind this tree. Now, he was trying to hide or whatever. So anyway, so as I was standing there watching, looking over, just trying to see what the hell am I looking at, um, it, I could see it actually foot step back, or I should say leg, and it stepped on a branch and you heard a big crack. So I just kind of stood there and it actually looked around the tree, peeked around the tree, looked at me, looked back down at the ground like, oh, I made a mistake or whatever, looked back up me at me, 
and then pushed off the tree and then went down on all four. But he went flying out. It's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Like 15 feet, he jumped out pushing off this tree and I could see feet and everything else. And he just kind of like zipped in lightning fast into this tree line. And he sat back there for about three hours and everything. So uh, Scott was actually at the BFRO investigator was on the other end of camp. So I had to go back and tell him, hey, I just had this creature out here, you know, and it was and I come back and grabbed him and everything. He grabbed his thermal. And I took him down to the spot and said, this is where it was at. And you can actually see through the brush there where it had ran through the brush and everything. And I said, he's still back there. I'll just leave it at that because we I have some other funny stories about going with Scott. But anyway, that's where we left it at. And I um, actually put my, uh, got my equipment out there, recorded it, and was there for over three or four hours. And it started raining and everything. So I decided to pack it up and go home about one o'clock in the morning. I think uh, Chuck, my minute Chuck, but Scott uh, camped out there. So anyway, so that was deciding anything. And what I seen the, for for description is basically I only had like a real good look, probably fifteen, maybe ten, fifteen seconds before I pushed off the tree. Was what I could see it was like it was almost getting dark. It was like I see a heavy brow ridge. This one, this particular one was a cinnamon, a cinnamon colored uh, squash. He was about, and actually I know the exact size because he was, when he turned his head around the thing, I seen a little knob in the tree and I seen the top of his head actually come across this nub of the tree, a little branch where it was broken off. And actually when I went back and measured that, that was eight foot two inches. So we know about the height and everything. Or why he was probably by four feet. But the only thing when I come to mind when I was looking at this creature is I was trying uh, to relate. My mind's just flashing or whatever on different images trying to relate what I'm looking at. I'm sitting there going, the only thing that came to mind was like um, an Eskimo. I just seen uh, fur. It was like light colored fur around the face. And I didn't see any hair on the face, but like I says, again, it was getting dark. And I couldn't really get a good look on everything. And I couldn't really see the eyes except for dark inset eyes. Except I remember seeing this big, heavy brow ridge. But it was just a humongous creature. It was massive, that's all I have to say. Um, other than that, that was the sighting. So, and then we had uh, probably later on this that year... It was the next year, I don't remember. I was out there with uh, two law enforcement officers. They were kind of skeptical and everything. And they were brought in by another friend of mine who was a researcher. And we were actually on the same end of camp. It was on the east end of camp. Out there with the thermals and everything. And we actually um, seen one sitting, hiding. It might be the same individual. I'm pretty sure it is. It was hiding behind this big stump out there. And I seen it pop up, and he was looking through that, and they they had their same thing. They said it was digging and stuff like that. I actually passed off my thermal and the, they said, oh, here's some, something over here. Keep an eye on that, uh, that stump over there. And they actually seen it pop up from the stump, and, and actually, I guess, when it's seen us looking at it, and again, this is dark out there, so I can only go with what's on the thermal. Um, this individual got up, kind of looked at us. You could hear him grunt, and then he ran to the south up over a hill and he he would sit over there for like 20 minutes and all of a sudden he would come popping back and he would come back down there and try to uh you know just keep an eye on us and or whatever he kept on coming back running up over this hill and coming back and running up over the hill and this was going on for a while so and actually he had uh some food out there on a stump and he was actually trying to make his way to the stump and i think every time we realized that it, you know we bring up our thermal to his eye, you know, our, my eye, or whatever, their eye, excuse me. Um, you can see that we were looking at the individual, so then he would run off. Like I say, he's doing this several times and everything. So finally, uh, the, the two cops or individuals I had with me, they actually were staying at the Whitaker end over there. So they went back to the hotel, I guess it was after one o'clock in the morning or whatever. And I actually had a uh, RV out there and I went and stayed in that. And actually had my court equipment out there and uh, this, the, the subject come back again. 
really late at night or whatever. I, it was probably two or three o'clock in the morning. And he, he made some good vocalizations out there, screaming out towards the RV, trying to wake me up or whatever. And I didn't hear him. And uh, he took the food and moved on or whatever. This is a normal activity they usually do, this that particular individual. So anyway, um, I also had another gentleman out there I had taken out with me. Now, this is the bad thing about taking people out with is um, – you, you try to tell it, convince everybody what you're going to run into out there. If you do, we do happen at that time run into kind of these Bigfoots and everything and everybody's kind of gun ho or whatever. And they're like Superman and uh, they'll do this and that and everything else. And, and I tell them, what, it's, they're pretty big creature. I mean, they're huge and massive, but I don't think anybody really gets that in their mind till they actually see one. Um, we had, went out there. I didn't heard too much or whatever. So anyway, uh, again, I stay out there in an RV. This guy had to stay in his car behind. It was parked actually behind my RV. Um, and we call it a night. Like I said, there was nothing traumatic out there. Just heard a few branches break. Nothing, nothing major. So anyway, in the morning when I got up, I actually had been putting food out there. I don't do that anymore. I'll have to it explained why and a lot of stuff I did, but that's stupid when I was younger. But anyway, uh, in the middle of the night, I guess he had something happen. So, but just to back it up, as, as I went out, I went to go get this plate of bacon uh, on a paper plate that I left on the stump. And I always try to keep everything way out there, away from camp. I didn't think they, they really didn't want them coming in there or draw any kind of predators in. But as I got up in the morning time, this was about 6.30 in the morning, I noticed as I went to go get out of my RV, which the door was in the back of the RV to get out, I looked down on the step, and here's this plate, this paper plate. And I said, well, where did that come from? You know, I had no idea it would have been the paper plate with the bacon and everything. So I actually went out there and looked, and the plate was gone. And I said, oh, that's a plate that I had put out here on this stump. And as I was returning, um, the guy that was with me, a partner, I won't mention his name because I don't want to make him look bad. But anyway, he come around there and I noticed his face was his face was completely white. And he was just really acting kind of weird and everything. I said, well, what, what happened? You know, what's going on? And he just said, well, this research and stuff is not for me. He got back in his car and left. And I thought, wow, that's kind of strange. And he was just you could just tell he was scared or whatever. And I actually couldn't get him to tell me what it was that he seen or what had happened for almost four years. He just kept on telling me he wasn't going to go back out in the woods anymore. He wasn't doing any of his stuff. So I actually got to talk to him four years later. And he finally told me what the story was. He says, in the middle of the night, uh, as he was sleeping in his car, he says, something bumped the car and woke him up. And he says, uh, he seen, even though it was dark out there, there was something through the windshield. So he turned on the lights of the car real fast. And he said, this thing was leaning over the top of his hood, looking, peering at his windshield and just scared the hell out of him. Now, he I won't found go that into, scary? Yeah, well, it, it was actually, <laughs> yeah, he found that scary because he said, <laughs> what's the deal with was, that? He said it was, well, he didn't realize it was so big. He says it was almost like the whole end of his car, end of his car was built by this creature and it was just bent i mean literally bent over and looked into the car i mean it's just huge it's the so, nightmare of nightmares yes well he actually uh i didn't want to i don't really well i don't mention any names but he actually uh feed his pants but <laughs> that's yeah, how oh, okay yeah <laughs> so, so i i can understand being embarrassed and i can understand yeah it's pretty traumatic or whatever but he said it was like six inches away from the windshield so it just scared him real bad so he won't go out in the woods anymore so that was what happened on that particular instance um and then i had took another gentleman out by death and this is really bad because you, i didn't realize that some people are just not apt to handle these situations and and the guy i took out was actually ex-military he had uh he was in a, a vietnam vet so i thought well he was telling me he could handle these you know any kind of situation he could just you know i, I think he kept on telling me he was going to stab it in the chest with a spear and i was just laughing i says you really don't 
have any idea what you're what you're talking about or with these creatures what you know how big they are and whatever so anyway this this was actually at the delta site uh we had a i assume it was a big male come in there and he was grunting and grazing and throwing brush and everything and i had this gentleman with me and it says well there it is go get the stabbing well he just broke down i mean literally had a nervous breakdown he wanted anything he didn't want anything to do with this creature out there and it, we were only there for like 20 minutes and this guy i mean i literally had to drive him home you know all the way home and this guy's just completely gone terrifying and everything it was another story where a guy was never going to go out in the woods again but i, I was just laughing because people always tell me how apt that they are you know deal with this kind of situation i say yeah it's great when you're sitting here talking about it in the day like but when it's dark out there and it's, it's, it, you know is and you really don't think they exist and you realize they do exist this is the things you have to deal with out there well so. you know ben <clears throat> you're exactly right and you know you get a lot of these guys that are that and and kudos absolute kudos to the to our vets out there who have combat experience. Um, we know a couple of vets, actually more than a couple, who have combat experience, who have encountered these things with other combat vets. And you suddenly realize that you are completely outclassed in every level and every aspect. This is not something that can be dealt with. You're not dealing with a silverback. You're not dealing with uh, a grizzly. You're dealing with something that is completely beyond your frame of reference. And, you know, so nothing nothing against this guy. I mean, there's a lot of people that, you know, I, I talk to him, and I don't even try to convince him anymore because you can't until you've been there. Once you've had that encounter, and, and some of the yeah. stuff that you're describing was – um, stuff that I've encountered myself with the behavior and mm. it's it's unnerving to say the least you know it's, yeah, it's this I is the nightmare nervous. of nightmares and I get nervous still and the more I uh, I interact with these creatures I guess they interact uh, I bet I had to go out there and research creatures I get more and more nervous and I am also a combat bat there's, mm -hmm. there's a storm so Okay. And this has you cannot relate in any way to uh, a war scenario compared to the, what you're encountering out there. It's not no. Ramadi. It's not Fallujah. No. You're not dealing nope. with insurgents. It's something totally different. Right, and there's something those you seem like situations you can control. This you cannot. So, um, I agree with you 100, percent Tom. I says, I says, and that's my my problem with people. I get. You know, I have to throw PSD, but I don't want to. Is trying to explain to people, and I, again, I do the same thing you do. I don't even try to convince people anymore that they exist. I just tell them, hey, this is what I have happen out there. This is what's going on. Either accept it or you don't. I don't tell you. I says I have no problem to be lying about or anything about that because I have nothing to gain. I'm not writing any books. I'm not, you know, uh, looking for fame. I don't run around on the circuit and start saying i know everything about bigfoot because i it's uh, many years as i've done in this it's not even compared what you guys have i still don't i still have more questions than i do answers you know very few answers you know you're no no you're you're exactly right i always say that i could write a much much bigger book on what i don't know than what yeah. i do know i know very 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 precious little and mm -hmm. um and, and you're right. You, you know, I got a buddy of mine. Uh, we went out, and all we did was we encountered first set of footprints as many years ago into an area where these things were. And all it's the very first time we had physical evidence. And your head's on a swivel. And this was an area. Now, you're in western Washington or somewhere in Washington State. Yeah, Is it okay to say? Is it okay to say that? Or? I, have, I hide nothing. So, like I said, not even the sites. I try to get people involved. You know, this is, right. I had nothing to hide. So, well, and you know what the visibility is with the understory? You know, you've got all the 
pine maples and the rhododendrons and right. stuff. So we had like 15 foot visibility. And we anyway, I'm I won't belabor the point, but we get back to the truck and he said, "Don't ask. I'm never coming back. That's it." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> To give people a reference point for how big these things really are, go sit in your car, look at the windshield. The faces on these things are at minimum about a quarter of the size of your windshield right. as far as width. Now, imagine having something like that looking in at you six six inches away. Yep. And and I agree with you know, and I says I see these creatures. So and when I do talk to people, when I know they're not telling me the truth, is when they, they talk to them like nonchalant. They're nothing, but it, it's a remember, it's a memorable experience because you're never going to forget these things. That that then when you first see one, and people never can relate. And I keep on trying to tell them, I says you can't relate to how big these things are. Uh, we're like little children, you know, out there. And, you know, these people tell me, oh, they can go running around after them and everything. I says, you change your mindset when you get out there with these guys and you actually see when you don't make those same kind of stupid stunts I used to do when I was in years ago before I'd seen them taking chances because these things are massive. And the world no, your buddy that wanted to stab days. them is a perfect example of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, people tell you all kinds of crap. I guess is that's what I tell them. And they they tell you this kind of stuff when, you know, when it's in a sun room in a room. Oh, they're going to do this and that, and chase after them. I says, well, you right. get out there and you actually see this. You'll never do that. You won't do those mistakes anymore. And I says, I've learned not to do the things I did when I didn't know. You know, uh, before I actually see what they look. I I I wouldn't do now. There's no way. I have to take a lot of bit of caution when I because I do a lot of this stuff by myself out there now, and I have to be cautious at all time because it seems like oh I'm, I might be on the menu I don't know. Ben, now, let I'm me running, ask you this. Yeah, go ahead. I got a question. <clears throat> um, have you seen them move in in their movement? And the reason I ask that because the one that I saw moving, it was this. It wasn't just the speed, it was the agility, it was the quickness. It was almost like watching something that weighs eight or 900 pounds moving with the jerkiness and the speed of like watching a little field mouse, you know, zipping around. What was, have you seen them walking or moving uh, at all? Well, walking, when I've seen walking, it's like a, I've seen backs of them or whatever, quick moves of the brush, but there's something weird I, I noticed when even when they went down on all fours, it's like this fluent motion. It, it's just like smooth. Yeah. But it's lightning fast. Um, yes. Even when they were down on all fours, it didn't seem like their head was moving up and down. It was just like kind of gliding across the, the top of the brush. And that, that's the only reason I can describe it is that's what I've seen. And I it's thought that was ghostly. what it is. What is it? It's ghostly. Yeah, it was it was just like gliding across, you know, and, it, and that's what was so strange about when you see this movement is to see a huge creature like that be able to move that fast and so fluent. I mean, just smooth, you know. Um, There's nothing else out there that moves I'm like that. somebody else gets to see the same stuff I did, I have because it's 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 we're always like one sided, you know, because you run very few people have had, actually seen them. They actually, you know, say, oh, well, I can relate to that. I'm glad I'm not the only crazy one because people think you're crazy half the time. Well, I tell people it doesn't mean I'm not crazy, but, you know, (laughs) (laughs) I'm certifiable, but (laughs) you do exist. (laughs) Um, And, you know, getting back to the the bravado, bragged issue of people who, who have not encountered them, if I take somebody like that, out into where these things are or i might you know they'll oh let me tell you what i would do i go okay um say what are you doing tonight 2 30 in the morning Hmm? (laughs) because everything that i would try to convince you of is pointless because after you have that encounter nothing more needs to be said Mm -hmm. is exactly 
Um, some people get it more interesting and it, they get interested in the subject, but they don't want to take any farther than that. They're still looking for that sighting and everything. I'm kind of like way beyond that point. I don't try to, you know, to see what, see what they are. I try to actually interact with them in regards to my research, not interact with the, the subjects itself, but, uh, just trying to, you know, get out there with them, but I'm not looking for that picture or whatever. Now I am trying to get thermal images or whatever video to see stuff that they're doing out there to have questions on because I hear the stuff going on for hours. Like they're pounding on stuff with rocks and I'm trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and, you know, and actually to see one knocking, that'd be nice too. Cause I don't know if they use a rock or if they use their hand, you know, some people say they've seen yes. sticks. I haven't seen any of that. I, 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 I same thing. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. I'm just saying. No, no. I, I have the exact same questions. Yeah. And um, I'm trying to figure those things out to see, you know, because the again, you hear the knocks are totally different. Sometimes it sounds like wood on wood. Sometimes it sounds like actually a rock hitting uh, 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 wood. And then there's sometimes I've heard these, it, it sound like a gun blast. And I'm trying to figure out how they make that sound. I mean, it sounded like actually a, a, a gun going off. Yeah, we heard the gun going off. Uh, Will and I did. Our our team did last summer. Oh, I'm glad and you heard that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, and it was yeah, in an area. Think, well, I make these things up. I says it's just weird stuff. To me, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's incomprehensible. It was in an area that was heavily wooded. And what was interesting was there was one like almost like one shot, then it was followed by the exact number of people in our group. So it was almost like, bam, heads up. And then and then the number of people in our group. And I, I, Kurt was with us. And I, I told Kurt, you know, at first he was like, that is not gunshots. And it took me a little while to go, yeah, you know what? It's not. There's no way that was... It, it wasn't. It was. You could almost look and see what the direction. You could almost look and see the location where it was coming from. Thick in the woods. There's. It, it wasn't deer season. There's no rifle range. It, yeah, there, it just made no sense. And then Will and I ran into, and so did everybody else in the group in different areas. Ran into growling right off the trail, and and I tend to be the worst. Bigfoot hunter out there. I'm an idiot. So I'm like, I wonder if they'll do it again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so I go back out there and, I, and it, 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 I don't know if Will's still on the phone, but um, yeah, it was louder and it was like, okay, Will's like, all right, we're going to walk out of here nonchalantly. <laughs> like <laughs> nothing's going on. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's, uh, they're, they're very, uh, um, you know, it'd be great for me if I had a lot of, you know, I'm taking a lot of people out there and stuff and it'd be <laughs> nice if I could get that kind of reaction. People with the experience, it, when you don't have the experience, it, it's, it's kind of tough, especially when you're by yourself. But, um, it, it's, it's nice to be able to sit there and share some of the stuff. Because, okay. You can hear that too. You know? Well, Ben, I will be I've back had, up there. I, I, folks, I was up there recently and I had to cut my trip short, but, uh, I will be coming back up. Hey, you're more than welcome. I'll take you back up there, and we can. It'd be nice to talk to somebody. And say, hey, this is this is what's going on. And like I said, I have a lot of. I always put recorders out there and everything. I, you know, anybody ever doubts me? I said, well, here, here's you can hear what I hear out there. I says, this is what I'm hearing. Um, even up to the last few days ago, matter of fact, I was out there yesterday doing some scouting. But I always have audios, and like I says, this is some of the stuff I'm talking about. I have proof you know, in regards to stuff that I'm recording out there, I've had hundreds of recordings and it, and it isn't just, and I try to tell people don't get so caught up on the vocalizations and everything. You got to understand what's going on out there because you got hours and hours and hours of these groups doing stuff. Um, like in the honey, I actually had one and I sit there going, well, I kind of stood there. I was talking to Chuck about it is that we were, I was hearing, probably three or four hours of activity. And what they're doing is they're beating the brush or breaking stuff, knocking. I don't know. They were knocking to one another. And, 
And see, I'm at the question, if, is this a hunting activity? I'm not quite for sure, but I says, I don't know who they're knocking to or why they're making so much noise in the brush. And this is going, and this, it does, it sounds like several individuals out there. You could hear the different knocks from different locations, at least seven individuals. Uh, so I, I assume, and I have to speculate again, it, this might be a hunting activity, but I have no proof because, you know, I haven't gone out there to see if they they were trying to scare up a deer or whatever, but I do have uh an audio of some creature out there and I, i'm not saying it's bigfoot i don't know exactly what that creature was so it might be something they scared up uh, uh a deer or something I've never, like i said i've been i haven't heard never it wouldn't have been a deer but it was some kind of creature could have been a coyote or whatever but i actually hey, have that yeah was this before or after they had kicked that male out of the group this would be after. This was just uh, about a week ago. Okay. You know, I okay. I I have lots of recordings of stuff to do it, but this was the the male individual. See, I have all these audios going on at the same time. Every site is covered by two or three uh, we call farms, which are field audio uh, audio recording monitors. But they're 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 monitoring the sites. That way, we know there are different groups or individuals that are out there. This, this was actually a group action of the B group, we call, uh, up at the Yankee site. These sites were within two or three miles of one another, almost all of them. And uh, as we monitor that way, we know it's separate individuals or whatever, if they're group related. You know, we have to, we, we're trying to keep track of all these particular uh, subjects altogether. To make sure they're not interacting or going to each site and thinking it's the same creature. Uh, this, it's hard to you know maintain groups out there and try to figure out where they're all. But if we know there's activity going on all these sites at the same time, so. But anyway, did oh. you want to add to that? <laughs> I didn't want to cut you off. Cause do, I was we, just trying to... Cause do we have time for him to talk about that uh, male that was kicked out of the group? Yeah, sure. I have, I have two males. I have yeah, tell one us about other, that, man. Okay, the one individual was the, from the A group. That that group, particular group, went over into, we assumed, a Mount Rainier uh, National Park. Now, that individual's been there for since 2015. Now, if we go set equipment there, he's always there. He comes in there um, around 10 or 11 o'clock, but it gets close to dusk. Um and he's the one that sits, we call, he's the rock guy. He kind of just plays with rocks all night for seven, eight hours at a time all night long. And he's at the trolley site. Um, this was the same individual that he called, Delta's about, Delta site, let me try to slow this down here, is about a mile and a half off to the north. And what he does, or he used to do, he doesn't do it as much anymore. I don't, matter of fact, I haven't heard him do it in a couple of years, but he used to call out to the Delta group, which we think is, uh, this is the D group, we call it. Um, this is, he would call out, he would go up to, across the road, uh, down by Cat Creek there. He would call out to the north. And then we get females to respond back and forth. And they would do this back and forth for uh, a couple hours. And then a big male uh, from the D group would call out and it would all stop. It was definitely a big male. It was a bigger male. I mean, we think it's the alpha of the group. But anyway, th this stuff stopped. All activity stopped. There was nothing going on. Now, he did this over... Um, Every time we put equipment out there, he would do the same thing. It seemed like and I got to where he was doing it once or twice a week. He'd do the exact same thing. Come walk over to the same spot in the creek. There we could actually find footprints over there. Call out to the D group. D group would respond. And then a big male would get involved and it would stop. It was almost repetitive. And this went on for a few weeks, probably say in a couple months. And we would get these same recordings back and forth. And I thought, wow, that's kind of strange. I said, why is he just calling out when he should be running over to the other group? He doesn't really need to call out. You know, they're there. But he stops at this particular area and just calls out. And that's what he was doing over and over again. Now, she asked him this question. I don't know if that's a territorial thing. You would think it was a territorial thing. I would think that. But I don't like to form opinions. But 
I get the same repetitive behavior. I don't know how to associate that with, with what is exactly going on. Anybody got any questions on that? Uh, maybe some answers. Well, we were talking earlier before we started recording about how he would call out and the females would answer and then the male would answer and shut it all down. We were talking about how the alpha was probably jealous and forced. You said something about uh, apes or gorillas or something. They'll actually beat up a female if she's caught mating with one that's outside of the group. Well, actually, um, let me um, go back here just a second. When he was talking about the, <clears throat> the males calling out to another group, that's usually, it, I think it is a territorial thing. Uh, chimpanzees do that quite frequently. It's usually only when they come uh, across paths and stuff. And you may have a male that will go out there and, uh, and bark and uh, make some loud screams and stuff to make his presence known. And they usually have a little uh, uh, posse of uh, uh, beta males that go with them uh, to back him up. And uh, the other group will just usually quietly go away every once in a while you'll get some interaction but not frequently because they really don't want to have any interaction because usually if you do then somebody's going to get hurt and let's face it they live in jungle situations and those uh, type of injuries don't always heal real rapidly but um, the what ends up happening sometimes is if an alpha male is uh, unseated in his position then he goes to the outskirts of the the troop i mean that that Primates are social, so they want to be with other primates. So uh, this occurs in chimpanzees and macaques and gorillas, and they'll just kind of lay low on the outskirts and not cause any problem because they know that they don't have anybody that's going to back them up if they get in trouble. <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I've got my horse. I'm a little bit hoarse today, so I keep clearing my throat, so I apologize for that. Um, but what ends up happening, too, sometimes is that you may have a – a male that's been unthroned as an alpha and he's out there hanging out on the outskirts of the troop um, that some female has actually bred with in the, uh, you know, previously when he was the alpha and there's females that actually may prefer him to the other male. And it has really has nothing to do with sex or anything like that. He might have been a more benevolent male than the one that took over because sometimes the males are not so nice to the females. They'll bite them and beat them up and do all sorts of stuff just to assert their authority. But if that, the present alpha male catches a female with uh, that male that has been unthroned and he's laying out the one that's laying out there on the outskirts, if he catches her breeding with that male, uh, he can he will hurt her sometimes and then mm. <clears throat> there may even be a fight with the other male he'll he'll make an attempt to run that male off and there have been times that they've actually killed him i mean they will he can get his little posse together and they will actually kill him and then that just alleviates the problem entirely and and i have a sneaking suspicion that bigfoot may do exactly the same thing, which is why I think you see sometimes these bands of ro roaming males, uh, maybe two or three that just kind of stick together for their own protection. You know, they might they might be younger ones that have been booted out of a, a group, a family group, because uh, they don't want inbreeding, so they kick the the, the boys out, and they may go uh, form a group with a, another older male that might have been dethroned and. Uh, you know, they've formed their own little groups for their own protection, really. Hmm. That's really interesting. See, I see, I just don't know anything about primates. That's what it's always good to get somebody <laughs> that's knowledgeable about that. Uh, well, studying the, and I tried to study the behaviors and everything, but I'm trying to always relate the research to what, you know, instead of formulating op opinions and stuff, and a lot of people like to give human traits to things, uh, I tried to get that like that um but it's nice to talk to me he's knowledgeable about that aspect of it well you're going to have human traits that pop up in all primates i don't care even in the, even the lower order 
uh, of simians, sometimes they do stuff that you go, oh, that's so human-like. Well, yeah, we're all primates. Humans are primates. Right. So right. uh, we're, 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 <laughs> we're, we're apes, too. So uh, we're the naked ape. But I mean, well, I, I think in a mindset, that's what I'm uh, trying to get is that people like to yeah. uh, would talk about human traits. They say, oh, he's thinking it's bored or, you know, it's giving a human emotion to it. And I go, well, I don't know if I would do that. I mean, I can see where the the a, the primate thing is, uh, but I just can't see, you know, they want to give it names. It's a pet. And I, uh, I just don't understand that. Um, well, it's definitely not. As, so. humans, as humans, we all anthropomorphize all animals. I mean, even our cats and dogs. And now we'll say this too. Now, um, and Tom will can concur with me on this. Uh, a surprising, uh, a side note is, um, it's not too unusual that people anthropomorphize cats because a cat's brain, believe it or not, is formatted exactly in the same fashion as a human's brain. And uh, so, when somebody says, "Oh, my cat," feels grief or emotions or love or this, that, and the other, guess what they do? So, well, um, you're yeah. exactly right for us. And the other thing cats do, my wife and I talk about it because we have two cats, is they sneak and they lie. They tell lies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see that about sheep, but that's okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's an old joke. No. But I, I understand what you're saying. That is, that's totally true. Um I, I think, it, but this creature, in my, in my particular opinion, is, is that people are looking for an interaction, and I just don't think that's possible. I, I've never seen that where they've, in all these years out there, and they know I'm out there, but I haven't seen anyone interact in any way, so to throw a rock at me or whatever like that. Um, they're cautious, I'm cautious, so I think that's where it's always, the trend seems to be, so. If they wanted to interact, they wouldn't still be a mystery. All right, and, and but I've had people sit there and tell me, and I look at them, and and uh, and I don't want to call people liars, but I say they're being dishonest because they're saying they're playing pity, ca- you know, patty cake out to these guys, or playing cards with them. I said, yeah, right, you know, I just don't believe that. Uh, I haven't seen anything to even indicate something like that. Um, Nobody, I have, we have never talked to a single credible witness. Mm-hmm. Credible witness is a key phrase. Yeah, that's the key because I don't think they're credible at all. And I, I no. run into a lot of these people out, you know, and they start telling me stories. I says, you know what, I just, you know, and then they want to go on a defensive and I says, well, what are you getting defense about? I'm just saying I haven't related, to, you know, ran into any kind of situations like that, like the paranormal stuff. I haven't run into any of that out there either. But you're telling me you know, these things are coming out of a portal and turn into a, an orb. I had never seen an orb out there, you know. You know, when you talk about the fear factor, you know, I tell people, okay, just sit in your living room. And if you have a, a standard American standard, you know, American Bureau of Standards lives, uh, living room height, the ceiling height is going to be seven and a half feet. So I want you to imagine something with its head at a minimum from your floor to the ceiling. And then quite a few of them are going to be Add 12 inches to that, add mm-hmm. 18 inches to that, and you're going to play patty cake with this thing? Yeah. <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, well, I try to relate to this. I said, you know, uh, Ivan the Gorilla, I think Will knows what I'm talking about, but the gorillas, the gorillas in the zoos or whatever. I said, I try to make people, I said, be in there with them because that's what you're like out there. They're not in a cage where you can just look through a window or whatever. You can look through things. I said, you're actually with these creatures out there. Um, and I said, you're going to tell me you're going to walk up to any gorilla or whatever, start playing, you know, patty cake with it, or you're going to give it a power hug or whatever, give it a back rub. Yeah, good luck on that. Yeah. And you just hit the nail on the head with this, is the fact that your sense of vulnerability is times a thousand because you're in its area, you're in there where you know you could not get away from it if it wanted to get you. And that is... Be on your guard at all times because these guys are pretty sneaky. I've had a few situations that it it, it acts like it was a predatory response when they were pulling. Um, My own, it's just, like I says, uh, I was, there was like one making a bunch of noise trying to get me, drawing me back into the heavy brush. 
And I thought, well, you know, I almost fell for it. I actually went back there. I says, I wanted to get, now I had my feet equipment, I get it on my GoPro. But as I walked back there, I realized I heard stuff off to my right and left. And I said, they're trying to draw you into the heavy brush, you know. Into an ambush. Yeah. And that's what, to me, it seemed like. And so I actually yeah. stepped back on the road. And I said, but they actually want to, you know, see me. They can come out here, you know, and see me just is the thing, but I says I didn't understand what they were trying to do, just trying to pull me back into the brush. But they were trying to get me to come into back, uh, back of the brush, which I thought was a predatory move. It wasn't like something trying to hide from me or whatever, you know, like a, a standard response. But it's just that these creatures were setting up something. Yeah, they're getting you closer and closer to the where they want you to be. Hey, listen, I got to ask you a question. Would you be available to come back on the show? We're, we're going to wrap this up here, but. Um, oh, yeah, because I, I, I need to scratch the surface and stuff. You know, the, I the can tell. Sound attacks. And it's like, since you try to squeeze, you know, 13 some years into one episode, it's, it's difficult. And I just want to make sure everybody's I'm credible about these things. Like I said, I can always prove everything I'm saying with, with audio recordings. But I just want people to understand what's going on out there, what real research is going on. You know, hey, Ben, how do you feel about doing exactly. a part two maybe next week? Yeah, that'd be great. I my my schedule's open. Okay, like he says I go out. My the only hobby I have is just going out and bigfooting. That's my only thing. I'm retired now, so I try to get out once or twice a week, and that's it. Okay, well let's plan on that then. Yeah, it, Mike says there's a lot of stuff I like to ask you guys on regards, uh, especially Tom. I think he, he I noticed on one of his other episodes he was talking about it first time, uh something happening to him. I I can pretty much relate to that. That and was only one I, time, but yeah. Oh, I well, it's happened twice in the same week. Yeah, so. it's, it's unpleasant. Well, listen, um, Will, if it's okay with everybody, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this go up. Right but ahead, I want to make an announcement first. Yeah, I want to thank everybody for tuning in and, and listening to this episode. Uh, Ben's description of behavior with these things resonates tremendously with what we have encountered. So if you like this show, you know what to do. Let us know. Click the like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed already. We have a lot of people who have uh, become strategic partners with uh, Creek Devil, and that helps us to go out and get you even more information, which we're doing. We're working on that. So if you want to do that, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Creek Devil, or if you're watching us on YouTube, in the description, there's a link in there. All you have to do is click the link, and you can choose um, any level you want to become a, a partner with us. So with that said, Will, I'm going to hand the mic back to you, and we're going to go from there. Okay. I just wanted to mention before we wrap, folks, that um, we get messages often uh, about, you know, listeners think the show should be have a wider audience and more our numbers should be higher than they should be. Um, everybody says this isn't us. Of course, we know the show is good, but everybody's out there who contacts us says this is the best show out there, the most informative. So we need your help, our listeners, to make those numbers grow uh, by getting the show out there to people and you know hitting that like button. Of course, people are doing that, and I thank everybody for doing that, helping us. But um, you know, it's working YouTube's algorithm and. I've been a little slow in getting the uh, the shows out on the other platforms. I've been gone uh, since I retired from work. <laughs> I've been busier than I, I was during my regular work schedule. So um, I'm home for a little while, uh, so I'll get that back on track. But uh, if you folks out there could help us by you know sharing and, and spreading the word about the show, we'd sure appreciate that. Ben, thanks, and we'll be looking forward to talking to you on the next episode as well and um thank you guys so we really appreciate it so thanks folks for stopping by and um you know join us monday for the monday review thanks for listening to this episode of creek devil if you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures please contact us at william jevning at yahoo.com that's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there. <laughs> <laughs>